morning, church. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. I want to welcome you all to our worship service here this morning at the Green Street campus of Cornerstone First Global Methodist Church. So thrilled and excited to have you all with us this morning as we gather together to worship the living God in spirit and in truth. just want to give you some announcements within the life of the church for this upcoming week and this upcoming month. If you have not already, please make sure you sign in on the attendance pads at the end of your pews. That way we can stay in communication with you, connected with you as part of the body of Christ. If you would do that for us, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. We are so thrilled and excited to announce that uh, in our youth group, we've got about six or seven kids that are participants in the junior anglers at the, the local high school. And it's, it's my you know, pride to, to, to announce to you all that they had won their state championship this past weekend. So. <laughs> Yeah, so if you see any of those floating around the church this afternoon, you wish them some congratulations for a, a job well accomplished in, in their most recent tournament. Uh, hey, if you're on the administrative board, just so you know, this week there's a meeting that is scheduled for Thursday at 515 here in the Green Street Sanctuary. Got a couple of important items on the docket to talk about, so please make your plan to attend if you sit on administrative board. Uh, We've got a couple of exciting things coming up in our, our children's uh, department here in the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, the, the next major camp, you know, they had God's Little Masterpieces camp this past week, which went off without a hitch. It was fantastic. Uh, coming for our children is the Kids on a Mission camp. It's coming up from July 10th, or yeah, July 10th to the 12th for grades 3 through 6. So if you've got children that you'd like to get registered for that, get in touch with Glenda directly or with the church office. We'll be happy to get them on the roll and registered for that wonderful event. Now, if you would like to help with that event, here's a couple ways you can assist in that wonderful form of Sunday afternoon, 4.30. We're going to have Scott Blake, who's going to come and do some entertainment, and we're going to have a potluck dinner. So if you come, make sure that you bring a dish to share with folks so that we can have a wonderful time of fellowship and unity and some good eating. So it'll be a wonderful time for, uh, for the church. Uh, we had Project 412 that happened this past weekend. It was a wonderful event that took place in our community. Uh, Jimmy Yates spoke about it a little bit at the Arbor. Uh, so if you'd like to see a little bit of a highlight reel and hear a couple of the stories that took place during 412, you can either talk with him and, and just ask you know, for him to share those, those wonderful stories with you, or you can watch the live stream of the Arbor service where he gives a, a wonderful description of everything that took place this past weekend. All right, those are all my announcements for this morning, but we have one more announcement to make, and at this time I'd like to invite Dave Upton, our SPRC chair, if he would please to come forward and, and make one final announcement for us today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This morning I have a bittersweet announcement to share with you. Um, as one of, one of the challenges of a new denomination and a new organization is that sometimes you have more churches than you have pastors. And we have been blessed here at Cornerstone to have two outstanding pastors. But it's been a busy last few days. Uh, I received a call on Friday from um, John Hill, who is the pastor at Flint Hill United Methodist and is our presiding elder, kind of like the old district superintendent used to be in the church and he's over this general area and he called me and said that uh, the Roanoke First Global Methodist Church is without a pastor and they are seriously looking for one and uh, have identified Matthew Colburn as a potential candidate for that and the cabinet on Friday evening uh, made that appointment and uh, Matthew will be uh, in, the, in the coming weeks uh, he'll be here with us another few weeks but um, uh, he will be moving uh, to Roanoke, where he will be leading and shepherding that church. You know, when I think about the time that Matthew has been here over the last two years, um, he has been a blessing to this church. He is a uh, outstanding speaker, uh, preacher. Uh, he he can pray a prayer like no other, <laughs> uh, and and he has blessed our church, and we are a better church because of him and uh, we will miss him and uh, I think about during the time of separation for our church I think about when we had a pastor who was going to be staying United Methodist and a pastor who was going to be going global with this congregation I think about the challenges that a young pastor like Matthew had 
he was kind of in the middle in many ways. And I think he showed great courage, great faith, and great fidelity to be with us today and the decisions he's made. And, and I think we can all be very grateful that uh, he has passed our way through this time. Now, we're going to have a great opportunity to say goodbye and wish him well and, and, and celebrate his, uh, his new opportunity, which, by the way, this is a great promotional opportunity for Matt. That is a vibrant church in Roanoke and uh, an opportunity to lead that church. I think it's just going to be awesome for him. But, but the SPRC committee right now is working on planning a celebration, and we will be announcing that probably in this next <laughs> week as to when that will occur, and I hope you all will, uh, will join that join us in that with us. So this church will be fine. This church is in great shape. Um, and I believe now that Roanoke will be in better shape than they were before this. And we wish Matt all the blessings as he continues his ministry there. Matthew. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it now. Before I get to tearing up, let me give you a couple of uh, <laughs> details related to this, uh, this transition. So my final, uh, or my first Sunday rather, at Roanoke will be July 16th. So that will be when I'm starting there and have transitioned over from being pastor at Cornerstone to pastor serving over there. Uh, if you're in my How to Read the Bible class, or if you're in the push group, the Pray Until Something Happens, uh, go ahead and continue to plan on meeting in our usual spaces, okay, on Wednesday. So push, continue to meet at noon uh, in that conference room, Bible study. We're still going to be at Green Street. I know we haven't met for about four or five weeks due to various circumstances, but we're meeting this week, uh, but I will not be there. Uh, Billy's going to be in both of those groups, and he's just going to simply kind of ask the question of what do you need from him uh, to help in, in kind of facilitating these groups if they need to continue forward and change gears or, or what have you. So he's going to do kind of a couple of listening sessions during our usual time just to see what the needs of those groups are for the pastor. Um, Billy is also going to be taking on preaching duties for both services. Uh, my last Sunday for preaching was this Sunday over at the Arbor. That's my final sermon that I'm preaching here. Uh, so I'm still going to be here for a couple more Sundays, okay? You're not done with me yet. Uh, I'm just going to be sitting in the pews versus sitting up here or, or delivering the sermon, delivering, delivering the prayers. He's going to take on both services uh, moving forward. And uh, to echo what David said, Cornerstone is in fantastic hands. Y'all are in my prayers just as I hope that I'm in yours. And I look forward to the wonderful ministry opportunities that await both churches uh, moving forward. So, whew, it's a lot in it. Miss Jenny, I think you understand now why I can't teach Beacon on, on July 16th, yes? <laughs> oh, goodness. All right, well, as we now turn our attention towards worship and worshiping the living God, let's go before our Lord together in prayer. Almighty and eternal God. You who have created and sustained all things by your word. That same word who took on flesh, who came to dwell among us, and who died to save sinners. We draw near to you this morning because you are infinitely worthy of our worship. You are greatly worthy to be praised. You have caused your grace, like rain, to fall upon the heads of the just and the unjust. You make your mercies new before us each and every day. And is in the death and resurrection of your Son... Jesus Christ, our Lord, by the witness of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, to the glory of our Heavenly Father, that we who believe now, having grace through faith, have received light and life, abundantly and eternally, here, now, and forevermore. It is because of that precious gift of grace that we draw near to you this morning, as one people, as your body, your church, to worship you in the fullness of spirit and truth, here in this hour. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your spirit on all of us who are gathered here, in person and online. That you would not only be the object of our worship here in this place today, but the very power and very authority by which we worship. That our worship may be to your glory and for the good of your church. Lord, we love you. We trust you. We surrender this time now and entrust its fruit into your perfect care. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. I invite you to take your hymnals and turn with me to page 139, and let's stand together as we worship with this glorious hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Let's stand and sing together.
please remain standing for the Apostles' Creed. Let us unite in this historic confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. one another as our children come down for the children's minute. everyone. We're so excited that you're all here. Last week, I want to recap on a little bit. We had an art camp. We called it God's Little Masterpiece. We had 35 to 37 children from four years old, supposed to be five, but most of them was almost close to that, all the way to third grade that came and did all kind of art things, celebrating God. And we also did something special. We did trays. Um, All these trays had Bible verses and these are going to go to Meals on Wheels at our next camp. So that's why we need people to drive, because we want our kids to be able to deliver those to the residents of Ellet City that are Meals on Wheels and be able to actually talk to them instead of going really quickly like you have to for Meals on Wheels. So that's why we're asking for people to help with that. But boys and girls, I got a question. There are many things in our life that we can't do on our own. Sometimes it's better if we have somebody to help us, right? You like your dad to help you? That's cool. Okay, so we're going to talk today about cooperation. And I'm going to tell you a little story about a little boy that went to a family reunion. And he had all these cousins. He had young cousins and old cousins. And his young cousins, that was more his age. The older cousins had a big cousin on there. He probably looked like Brother Matt. He was very big. He liked to tease him and 
aggravate him. He came up to him one time, hey, I want you to play football with us. All of y'all against me. And they're thinking, oh gosh, we're finally going to get to beat him at something. Because if all of us against him, definitely we can do that. So here they are, they're playing football. And guess what? Every time they went to, to go up to try to tackle him, he'd throw him down. It was sort of like a, what do you call that thing? A tennis ball. A tennis ball against a brick wall. It just bounced there and bounced in. That was their bodies. That's how big he was. And so all the kids were like, wait a minute, we got to do something. We got to come together and we got to take care of this. We got to cooperate. Let's all get together and do this. So that's what they did. They said, next time that he comes by, let's just grab hold of him. And that's what they did. When he come around to come try to tackle him, because he was telling everybody how good he was, they all started getting on top of him. And guess what? He couldn't make a touchdown then, and so they won. And they were all excited. And you know what happened? They worked together, just like we need to work together as Christians to get the things done that God wants us to do. Now, when God made heaven and earth, in the first week, he was like, oh, let's make, there's a sun. He did that. That's good. He did the, the flowers. That's good. He made Adam. That's good. But he did one thing wrong. The thing he did is he fixed it, though. He said, no person should be alone. So he made Eve. And he replenished the earth with different people. And that's what he wants us to do is to work together. And boys and girls, when we do this next camp, we're going to have so much fun. We're going to get to show people God's love. We're going to get to show people how much we care about them at our church. And so when you're having a hard time at home and you're fussing with your brother and sister, remember what I said. Cooperate. Go as a team. So next time Caleb gets on your nerves, so you got to cooperate, okay? Now, Lindley is going to come right here. I'm going to show you all something. When you work together, things happen. Sort of like this. They cooperated all the different colors and made something really special. In our church, we're going to make things special, too. We're going to show everybody how much God loves us, right? All right, Lindley. Please bow your heads. Dear God, thank you for allowing us to see this new day of this new week. Father, we thank you for today. We give this special day over to you. May we rest in your presence, bathe in your goodness, and celebrate your eternal life. This day and always. In your name we pray. Amen. Awesome job. All right, boys and girls, my candy man's over here, and he's got some of these awesome cooperation <coughs> Suckers for you. You want to come get one? Dear Father God, we pause this moment just to thank you for the unbelievable blessing of sending your Son to this earth to die on the cross so we could be forgiven and have a relationship with you so that you could live in us and use us to change the world in your name. And Father, this congregation lifts up Matthew to you. We praise you for the way that you have used him the way that you have touched so many lives through him. We pray for Roanoke, that your Holy Spirit would certainly descend there and, and, and create an environment where worship could go on and fill him with the right words to be the leader and make the difference that you've called him to do. We are so thankful for young men like Matt who have decided to follow you. How desperately we need that in our world today. So take this new combination and use it to stir the hearts of Roanoke that they might be blessed with your wonderful grace. Father, we lift up those that need your healing touch in, in their lives, physically and spiritually. 
we lift up this nation as we approach a, a birthday to understand that our wonderful nation was founded upon you and your truth. Bless our leaders as they make decisions and convict them to know that it should be based in your values, in your standards. For our families, these wonderful young people we see in front and the responsibility that we all have to set an example in front of them so that you would be lifted up and glorified in all things. For the church today, for the unity that we would pray that the, the denominational barriers would simply drop and that your church on this earth would be unified in your word and in your son who came to die for us. Lord, we're so thankful for all that you've done for us. Help us to truly be your witness in everything that we do and to give a little more of ourselves today than we did yesterday and a little more tomorrow than we did today. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We're never alone. No matter how difficult the obstacle, your Son is with us. The mountain's not too high, and the darkness is not too dark. We, we praise you for the opportunity to know Him and to know that we're never alone because of His presence in our life. Forgive us of our sins. We pray in the name of Him who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I am the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Now if our ushers would come, we'll worship with our tithes and our offerings. Dear Father God, thank you for the opportunity to give. And we pray that every gift that is given, every talent, every opportunity in this church is used for your glory. Take this offering and use it for the building of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
I needed that. <laughs> Probably not the easiest Sunday I've ever had. Um, earlier this morning, I found out that I would speak to a church, which I've done, and it would be the last time that I would speak to them <coughs> since 2016 when I started. So uh, that, that wasn't the easiest thing I've ever done, for sure. I've told Matthew this, but I want to tell him this in front of you, that uh, I love him. We've become great friends. I think we shared everything that we should share together, and we've taken steps in step on everything that we tried to do, and that I will do anything in my power to help him. I'm proud and supportive of the ministry that he's fixed to undertake. He has my prayers. He has the prayers of this church. He has the support of this church. And I just think there's fixing to be another church that's going to be led by the Holy Spirit, like the blessings that we've been feeling here. So, Matthew, let me tell you something, man. I'm there for you. I love you. And one more thing i got to say <laughs> before I get into the message, and I don't like doing this, uh, but I need to share something with you. It's exciting. It's fantastic. But uh, it's going to be presented to the board. I want, you, I want everything to be out there where everybody understands it. There's a group of us that are considering a new organization called Ascend. It's going to be an outreach program for at-risk young people in our area from 16 to 24. I'm giving you a shortened version of this. To put it in a nutshell, we want to take young people in those age brackets that are at risk and put them into the workforce. We want to get them jobs in this community so that they can start feeling the good feeling that you get when you work for something and to hopefully take their life in a different direction. Now, a pretty strong group in Montgomery was nice enough to extend a deadline on a grant. On July the 5th, I will be presenting that presentation to that group. We've tried to do in three weeks what it takes six to eight months to do. And jumping through the hoops of a, of a federal grant are, are difficult. But I believe that God is in the middle of this, and I've already seen what He can do. So I think that the chances are good that we will receive this grant. Now what does it mean to the church? To the church it means that a sin would be housed in our new youth center separately from our youth center, but kind of built onto the side of it. It will mean, I think, close to $300,000 of support for this church 
by getting this grant. Well, how, how in the world do I come up with that? Well, a bus that will be bought that can be shared with our youth in the Ascend program, salaries that can be shared, lawn, lawn care and cleanup that Ascend would also be a part, plus a $5,000 lease to the church every month for the use of the facilities for Ascend. And I can promise you that at no time will it conflict with any of our youth activities. It will only be on hours that do not conflict with our youth program. I've talked to David Hand about it. It sounds too good to be true, but it's going to be a challenge. But if you'll be praying for us on July the 5th, I just think you should know. I'll answer any questions that you've got because I don't want to take away from the message. Uh, I'm going to be presenting it to the board next Thursday to make sure that they're on board. I'll be explaining it next Sunday at the Arbor. Uh, I'm there for the questions. But Jesus said, go out into the world and help those that need help. I'm sort of tired of driving down the road and seeing 24-year-olds sitting on their porch. I would like to see them have the blessing of being in a full-time job. So that's our goal. Be praying for us. Thank goodness I'm doing a message today that has a biblical principle in it that has changed my life. It's in the first book, Call to Live. It's made a difference. I believe in it wholeheartedly. And I'll try to share it within the time frame uh, that I'm allowed. But the title of this message is Who's to Blame? And the, the Scripture is John 9, 1 through 3. So let me go there and read this. John 9, 1 through 3. As Jesus went along, He saw a man blind from birth. And His disciples asked Him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that He was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in Him. May God add His richest blessing to the reading of His Word. May everything I say, everything we think, be to glorify Christ. Let us pray. Amen. Well, it sounded like a logical question. Here was a man that was born blind, and the first thing that the disciples asked was, whose fault was it? <laughs> was it his fault? Was it his father's fault? Pretty much of a, a logical question, I guess, that disciples asked that day. Of course, this man was born blind, which means... He didn't have anything that he could have done before he was born that would have caused this. But many times the Jewish people felt like that Exodus 4, 6, which says that God's, God visits the third and fourth generation of those who sinned against Him and hated Him. I believe that Scripture. I, I believe that there were things that I could do in my family's life that would be such that my great-great-grandchildren would suffer from it. So, the disciples were Jews. And Jews believed in the law, and the law always has someone to blame, doesn't it? They even used the law to blame Jesus. That probably is what put Him on the cross. You know, so don't be too surprised if they ask that question. There's a lot of blaming going on. Well, we could spend a couple of hours talking about who's to blame for this and that. I mean, who's to blame for the high gas prices? I mean, is it the Middle East? Is it our own companies? Is it our need for a car that uses gas? Well, what about pornography? Uh, is that Hollywood's fault? Is that uh, uh, the Internet's fault? Or is that just the moral decay that we've allowed happen in this country? And what about divorce? What about teen pregnancy? Who's to blame for that? I don't have to go through all of that. There's a lot of blaming going on in a lot of different ways. Even in the church. We should know this. One church blames this side, one side blames this side, and of course, if you want to have some unity, you can always blame the preacher. 
right? <laughs> the sermons are too long. They're too short. They go over my head. They're too simple. As the song says, well, he didn't even shake my hand. So we <laughs> always have people that we can blame. I think there are basically three categories of blamers in our country, and I think probably I'm fitting all three of them at times. But the first one are people that blame other people for all everything that happens in their life. It's always someone else's fault. You're looking at a football coach, man. I send a play in and it flops. I pull the back out and I say, what happened? They're not blocking, coach. They I mean, there was no hole there. I, mean, I got killed. So I put him in, I take the lineman out. What happened? We had a hole, coach. He didn't hit the hole. I had my guy blocked. So, so I take him out and I go all through the team and find out it's really nobody's fault. It's all someone else that did it. And then the fans, I've, I've been afraid. Well, let's talk about coaches for a minute, right? When the play doesn't work, well, what's going on? Well, it's the coach's fault. Of course, they always decide that after the play, <laughs> not before the play. That coach, I'm telling you right now, say, hey, that was the sorriest place. What in the world is he doing? But if all else fails, blame the referees. Right? It's those referees. I saw them here last year. Every call went against us. They got it out for us. Somebody's in their back pocket. It's the referees. It just goes on and on and on and on. In 1994, I had the blessing of coaching West Point High School to the first undefeated season in the history of Coleman County. Now, we went 10-0, and 0, and we had a little sign, and it was the guys, it wasn't me. I noticed we walked off the practice field early in the summer, and I saw this sign that said, no excuses, no regrets. Pretty good. I didn't do it, you know. The reason that team was good is we had good players, and nobody got hurt that year. But we adopted a philosophy of no excuses, no regrets. No excuses. If it happens, it happens. Take responsibility for what's happening. And I will say this, for that year, I'm not saying that contributed to our undefeated season. I think it did. But I will tell you, it was an awful fun season. No excuses from the coaches. No blaming. And we got beat in the third round of the playoff by a better team. No regrets. We had done the very best, at least that we thought, that we could do. Sort of a funny story in the Bible is the man that lay by the pool at Bethesda. A man who was paralyzed and the, the, the waters of the, of the pool there were very therapeutic. And this man lay there for 38 years beside the pool, never getting into it. Jesus walks up to him and says, do you want to get well? And he looks up at Jesus and he says, Sir, you've got the wrong idea. So it's not my fault, you know. Every time somebody comes by to help me into the pool, the pool's full. And then when the pool is not full of other people, there's nobody here to help me. Lord, it's not my fault. It's always someone else's fault. There's always someone else to blame. Do I dare talk about being a principal just for a second? I've talked to many, many parents in my life, and, and tremendous, great. It is an honor to work with those parents. But there is an element in our society that the, their kids, it's always someone else's fault. Well, let me just tell you something, Mr. Coleman. It's that thinking teacher down there. Have you been in there? Have you listened to them? They're, they're not fair. Coach hasn't put my kid in. He's, he's probably the best player on the team, but Coach just doesn't like him. And over and over again, we, we teach our children, maybe, that it's never their fault, and we're going to raise a child that takes no responsibility because it's always someone else's fault. Well, let's get off that subject. There are people in the world 
They think everything always is blamed on other people. The second group we talk about is people that blame themselves. I actually think that of the two, that is the most dangerous and most desperate one. People that blame themselves for everything. When I first came to Benjamin Russell, I pastored a church called Friendship. You probably remember right in Acusa County, you know. Uh, great people, wonderful people. Some people started coming to the church that lived on the lake. And I got a call from a wonderful grandmother that lived on the lake, and she sounded <coughs> terrible. So much so that I got down there as fast as I could. I dropped to do what I was doing. She sounded awful upset. And I got there, and here was her story. We bought this place on the lake so that our granddaughter could come down and spend time with us. And she has. It's been great. We're getting to spend quality time with our granddaughter. But their granddaughter became friends with the daughter of the people that live next door. And the daughter of the people that live next door was into drugs. Well, you know the story. It wasn't long before her grandmother found out that the granddaughter was also in the drugs and she was arrested and she was sent off for drug rehabilitation. And I saw that woman right there break down like I've seen very few people in my life because she was so full of guilt. Billy, why did we buy this house? Why did we come down here? If I had known that my granddaughter, this was going to happen to her, we would never have done that. And I, it took me two or three hours of praying and talking and finally trying to bring some peace that only God can give in that situation. But some people blame themselves. The Wounded Spirit by Frank Peretti was introduced to me when I was a principal. It's about the evils of the elementary playground. You know? Oh, I've been out there supervising them in my lifetime. It's probably the most cruelest place in society because kids will say anything. They have no filter. And they will say cruel things to other kids. But here's the problem. Those kids start believing it when they tell them, I decided at West Point, we, get, we bought that book and gave it to every school in the Coleman County system and talked about trying to stop. Some people would call it bullying, but back in those days, it was just talking mean-spirited to other kids and stuff. Tried to stop that to the best of our ability. I mean, we had some success. But those kids, would, once they were told they were fat or they wore glasses, or they weren't fast, or they weren't tall, and all the things that kids would say, and they take those and internalize them, and they grow up with those kind of issues in their life. Their self-esteem is terrible. So you try to address that. Because people have a tendency to want to blame themselves for things that happen. Let's get off that. Let's go to Andy Griffin, right? where Barney loses a game of checkers because Henry Bennett is standing behind him. And when Barney loses, he looks at Henry Bennett and says, well, there's the reason I lost right there. Everybody knows Henry Bennett's a jinx. And, of course, then Henry Bennett starts thinking he's a jinx. And finally, the whole town has to do a great act of love to get him back into the mood that he was in. But there's a lot of people in this world that blame everything on themselves. And then finally, there are those that blame everything on God. It's always God that's to blame. I've spoken to some of those. A young man that was life was going in the wrong direction, and at first glance when you talk to him, you kind of think he has no excuses. But when you hear his story, you kind of understand that if I had been him, I might not have been any different. Because at five years old, his dad left him, and when he was six years old, his mom got cancer. And he looked me in the eye and said, Coach, look, if there was a God, I wouldn't believe in, in Him because I won't, I'm not going to believe in a God that does stuff like that. The good news is this young man accepted Christ later. 
and it changed his whole life. But I certainly could understand, I think, where he was coming from. But the worst, probably of all, was Stephanie. Seven, Shereen knows what I'm talking about. Seven years old, Stephanie Sims. I was pastoring a church in college. Every time she'd walk out the door, she'd hug my neck. She'd tell me that, I loved, that she loved me. And I would say, I love you, Stephanie. And I did. The sweetest, nicest little girl you could possibly meet. The perfect little seven-year-old girl gets run over by a drunk driver in the middle of the day. I'm sitting at the coffee table across from Pat, her mom. I knew it was coming. <laughs> I knew. Billy, I just got one question. I know you do. Why did God have to take Stephanie? I was 21 years old at the time. I'm 68 now. 47 years. Today, my answer is still the same. The same answer God gave me at 21. Well, Pat, I don't think God makes guys go get drunk and run over seven-year-old girls. I don't think that. I also don't think that God gives six-year-olds mamas cancer. Here's what I do think and believe. I believe that God... And I told Pat, I, I believe that God will take this situation and use it for His glory if we allow it. And four days later at Stephanie's funeral, four grown men accepted Christ into their life. But God... Uh, let's go back to this story and kind of conclude it. Here's what I learned from this story that changed my life. It wasn't the disciples' question, it was Jesus' answer. Master, who's to blame? Whose fault is it that this man was born blind? Was it his sins or the sins of his father? And Jesus said, neither are to blame. This happened so that God could be glorified. It's not who's to blame. It's who's going to fix it. I've been the principal at West Point High School for six months. We're down here at the lake for um, Labor Day weekend. I get a call from my buddy up there at West Point, Billy, the school's burning down. What? We get in, by the time I got there, it was too late. West Point High School was laying in ashes. Smoke was coming up. 50 TV stations were there. Fire trucks all over the place. I'm walking up there, and five microphones are thrown into my face. Mr. Coleman, you're just getting here. You're just seeing what we're seeing. What is your reaction? to this. And this scripture pulled my rear end out of the fire because I was overwhelmed. I'm thankful that nobody was killed. And today, we start putting West Point High School back together again. Those three young men that went on a, a drunken drug episode, burned two schools and a bunch of others, those kids got 90 years in prison. The highest amount of years ever given to arson in Alabama. 90 years. But you know what? When those three guys went to prison for that, the school was still burned. Yes, they were being punished. Jesus said, it's not who's to blame. What are you going to do about it? That scripture came to me when I needed it. And we started to do something about it. We started building it back, and we did. We had a wonderful experience out in a trailer park 
And then we built a new school, and the kids were great, and people put... The only Sunday that I have ever worked during, during church was then the whole church where I attended was at West Point. We had a devotional. We started nailing nails and boards, and we put in four days, we were back. Jesus came to fix it. That's why He came. And the question is not who's to blame. The question is, what are we going to do about it? That's what I need in my life. And that's the challenge that I leave with you. The rest of the story, the, the, the Jews, the Pharisees find out about this. They question this blind man. All he does is make them mad. He told them, he said, well, you know, he, he spit on the dirt and made some mud. You know, in the Jewish law, that's... He broke the law. And they said, this man couldn't have made you see. He broke the law. Because the stupid law that they had said, you can spit on a rock, but you can't spit on the dirt. If you spit on the dirt, you're making mud, and that's working on, on the Sabbath. You can't do that. And that's what they threw out at this guy. I love that, that blind man. He looks and hey, do you want to follow me? <laughs> then they just throw him out of the sanctuary. They've had it with him. Jesus came to fix it. Let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you for this truth that makes such a difference in my life. And I, I, I speak for me today. Help me to quit blaming people for stuff and to do something about it, to live a life to show you that you can use me if you, if you will. Thank you for this wonderful group of people here today. We're thankful today that we, we don't get what we deserved. You were more interested in fixing our life than you were to blame us for all of eternity. We thank you for your grace, and we pray that you'll use us to make a difference. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Our closing hymn is Trust and Obey, hymn number 467. Let's stand together as we sing.
so excited today to have Claude and Teresa, how about that, Williams, coming from Sylacauga First United Methodist Church to be a part of Cornerstone Global Church. Welcome. Welcome. I know you're going to want to come down and say hello. Just one question. Will you be loyal to Cornerstone? Support it with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. I know you will. <laughs> we are so glad. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. This church is alive. Jesus Christ is our Lord, the cornerstone of our faith. In his name we pray. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you. 